I wonder today uh, if anyone here, we've got three or four in our group here today, uh, if I were to ask you what your favorite book is, we'd probably get some different responses. Um, actually, there was a, a magazine, uh, the Yale Alumni Magazine, that did a kind of a survey and asked that question, what is your book that had the most impact on you in your life? And the responses were a little surprising to me. Um, a Yale professor mentioned this, Winnie the Pooh, as one of the books that had a profound impact on their lives. They talked about the different characters and, and all of that and learning uh, that they, they taught life lessons of how to deal with life and how to deal with things in the classroom. And so I thought that was interesting. <coughs> and then uh, someone mentioned the story by, it's an autobiography by Helen Keller, The Story of My Life, how that w was very impactful in their life and is actually another professor who had found this book who was a professor in Africa and pulled this book out of the trash can and read it and it had a very profound impact on their life. One of the persons at Yale Peabody Museum said that a book that had a big impact on them was the giant golden book of dinosaurs uh, and other prehistoric reptiles. And even though some of the material is outdated, it, the pictures and the book uh, continues to inspire them. Well, <clears throat> I imagine there's a lot of books out there, uh, and I can think of books that I've read that have had a big impact on me. But I would say that if you were to ask a lot of Christians that I know, most of them would say the Bible that the Bible has had the most impact on their life. Specifically today, uh, some would say the book of John, where we're talking about today. And you could take one verse in John, John 3.16, and look at the impact that verse has had on so many people. Martin Luther called it the gospel in a nutshell. And I think there's some truth to that. And you think of the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well, which teaches us about how Jesus uh, intersects with different faiths and different uh, people from nationalities, other places. And so you, you, you get a picture of, of Jesus and his ministry going far beyond Jerusalem. And then we come today to this passage in John chapter 11. It is a story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. It's a story most of us are familiar with. Jesus had developed a relationship with these people. And uh, you remember the, the story of Mary and Martha and how he had been to their home probably many times. And... Uh, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Martha got a little upset. Um, but as the custom of in those days, uh, the women were usually doing the cooking, and uh, it was much different than those times. So Martha got upset about that, and Jesus said Mary had chosen the good part. Then we come to uh, this passage today, and it's the passage of uh, really talks about the, the death of Lazarus and uh, his raising, Jesus raising him. And the question you may wonder this morning, what does this story have to do with my life today? What does this have to do with anything that's going on in the world today? And I want to say today that I think it has a lot to do with our world today. And I think there's some lessons that we can draw from this as a people of God. 
we understand that there's a lot of people that are afraid. And then there are people out there who are from uh, more of what I call the prosperity gospel who would, who would say to people um, that, you know, you don't have anything to worry about as long as you have faith in Jesus. And I want to say today that there's some things from this passage that I think can give us some insight onto those things. And the first thing is this. Trusting in Jesus does not necessarily prevent death and disease. And let's just put that out there, okay? I, I know those uh, who will say, you know, uh, you know, that I don't have anything to worry about. But I'm not here to, to take away your hope. But I want you to understand that Jesus said that it rains on the just and the unjust. And, you know, it's not going to be everybody that has the letter C on their back, as for the word Christian, is going to be exempt from the troubles in this life. Look at the apostles and the life that they lived and the deaths that they went through. And you'll understand a little bit about the fact that what Jesus is talking about. That bad things sometimes happen to good people. Excuse me. <coughs> and so what I'm saying today is that we put our trust in Jesus knowing that God is in control. But at the same time, that does not necessarily prevent death and disease. Look at the story. Lazarus dies. And it wasn't because they lacked faith. I believe that Mary and Martha and Lazarus had faith in Jesus. They knew Him very well. They heard His Word. They sat at His feet. And their trust was in them when it was in him. And yet Lazarus died. I've seen a lot of posts and comments on Facebook lately, and other people have talked, and, and some of those are about, well, about people, uh, you know, God doing this so people would get saved. Other posts are about how this disease is God's punishment on wicked people. And I just want to say that I don't find that kind of rhetoric very helpful. I don't find that it's the kind of rhetoric that is going to want to draw people to our churches. First of all, I want to say this, that I don't believe, personally, this is my personal theology, and you may differ on your opinion. I do think that sometimes that we, we uh, reap what we sow. But I don't believe God is up there pulling the strings, making people get sick and die. I believe we live in a world that is sinful, and is filled with disease. And as I said last time, we know something about germs. We know something about disease. We know something about uh, earthquakes and plate tectonics. All these things we understand a little bit more today than we, we did at one time. But let's suppose for a moment that maybe the God of the Old Testament was that kind of God that people portray Him to be. I sometimes think of that young boy, uh, the young kids standing there with a magnifying glass with the sun beaming down through it, torturing the ants and burning them alive. And I think there's some people who sees God that way, but I don't. But let's suppose that was that is the God of, that may be in the Old Testament. I'll just humor you there. I want you to understand this. Jesus died on a cross for your sins and for mine. His death was sufficient. And it says in John, 1 John 2, 2 that He is the propitiation, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. And so when Jesus died on the cross, that satisfied the righteous demands of a holy God. 
And God looks at Jesus, and He's able to see the Son of God who died on the cross for the sins of humanity. I believe that the problem of sin was satisfied on Calvary. And I don't think God is up there just pulling strings and taking people out because they mess up. Because if He is, we're all in trouble. <laughs> You could take the best person in the world today, and we don't measure up. Now, you can choose not to believe and serve God, but I want to tell you something. God is not out to get you, not in the way you think. I believe God is constantly pursuing you. We talked about Wednesday night on our Facebook Live that in Psalm 23 that he's talking about God pursuing us that surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of, the li of our lives. And the idea there is that God is constantly pursuing us, wanting a relationship with us, that God wants to have a relationship with you. I think of the prodigal son who came home, and it wasn't the father who turned his back on the son. It was the religious older brother. It was the father who ran to him and met him and kissed him. That's the God that I know. That's the God that I see today who is pursuing and constantly looking and longing. I think of that, I remember when I was in 4-H camp, them telling the story of the prodigal son as a young boy. It had a, an impact on me. And he talked about how every day the, the, the dad would go to the front porch and look out over the valley just looking and waiting for his son to come home. And I thought about that. That is a picture of God for a lost world today. A God who's not out to get you, but a God who wants to get you to come to Him. And He's longing and He's begging. And yes, you can say no. But He's not going to give up. He's going to keep pursuing, I believe. I moved to Indiana when I was a senior for a while. One day my uncle showed up and asked me to go with him to Indiana. And I rode in the back of a rent rider truck all the way to Indiana, slept on the, the moving blankets. Uh, he was a furniture dealer. And when I got to Indiana, <coughs> excuse me, I ended up staying there. Uh, and decided I was going to, it was my senior year, that I was going to go to school there. But after a while, I got pretty homesick. And I could have finished school there, but I didn't know any of the people there. And I missed my friends, and I missed my family, I missed my mom and dad. And I called them on the phone one day and I said, would you come and get me? I want to come home. And I'm so glad that they were willing to do that. They could have said, no, you made your choice. You just stay where you are. But they knew I wasn't happy and they came and got me. And it was such a wonderful thing to be uh, heading back home to the mountains. And I think of God in that way. A God who when I call and say, I've wandered far away from home. I just want to come home. I think of God who's saying, I've been waiting for your call. Just come on home. Maybe your picture of God's different than that. But that's my picture of God. He's a loving God. He's a very loving God. So as I said, trusting in Jesus does not necessarily prevent death and disease, although I think it, we will make better choices if we do trust Jesus. And we will not do some things that would harm us, like I see a lot of people today. And therefore, a lot of people do end up living longer lives who, uh, who follow uh, 
the commandments and who live good lives. Because they're doing smart things and making smart choices. The second thing I want to say is this. Trusting in Jesus does not necessarily prevent disappointment. It does not necessarily prevent disappointment. Um, Mary and Martha were disappointed in God. Jesus heard about Lazarus, but instead of coming immediately for whatever reason, he waited. And by the time he arrived at the home, Lazarus had already been dead for four days. And to make it plain that he was dead, the Bible says that when Jesus was going to resurrect him, that somebody said, by this time he stinketh. Because without embalming in those days and, and different techniques, uh, you can imagine. But I think of how they must have been very disappointed. You know, sometimes in life, we have our expectations of what we want to do, where we want to go, and what we think should happen. And we make plans. How many plans have been made? You know, we had made plans to go to a concert in Lexington when all this hit. Other people made plans for ball games and different things. And sometimes things don't work out the way we plan. And sometimes God does not do what we think He should do when we think He should do it. And so, Jesus arrives finally at the home, and Mary doesn't even go out at first. She's, I think she's so distraught that she doesn't even leave the house. And Martha is the one that goes out and says to Him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Eventually, Mary comes out, and she says the same thing. If only you would have been here. <laughs> if only you would have done this, or if only you would have done that. And I want to say today that there's going to be times in life that we're going to be disappointed, and I can see that here. If I would have done this, if you would have done that, if God would have done this, this wouldn't have happened. They didn't understand it either. Many of those that stood by said that He opened the eyes of the blind and He could not prevent this man from dying. And there's a lot of questions in this life, a lot of questions that we have that I don't have an answer for. And it keeps some people from even believing. But I want you to understand that Mary and Martha didn't have the answers. But they still knew who had the answers. And they were not looking for a theological explanation. When they came to Jesus, they brought their frustrations and their anger to Him. And I believe Mary was very upset. And she fell at his feet and began to cry. If only you would have been here. And you know, if, if, if is a word that doesn't always help. It's usually not helpful. Lord is a word that heals. But she said, Lord, if, if is a word that has no explanations. So I want to say today that life sometimes brings us disappointments. But I do want to say this, that trusting in Jesus does give us hope for the future. Jesus said to Mary and Martha, your brother shall rise again. Now, that may not have been the word she wanted to hear, but that was true. She didn't know how true and how soon, but she knew it was that Jesus was talk, in her mind talking about a general resurrection sometime. She said, yeah, I know that He's going to rise in the last day. Uh, I know about that. 
And you know sometimes when people come to us and they try to offer uh, something that would cheer us up when we're down, it doesn't always do that, does it? Sometimes what we need is not a theological explanation, but we just need Jesus. And that's what she needed. And so, I think sometimes that we have to be careful that we're not so focused on the here and now that we lose hope for the future. And the thing I, I want you to understand that life does bring us disappointments, but here's the thing. God may not always do everything we want Him to do. God will do what He knows best. And in the end, He'll make all things right. As we think about this pandemic, most of the focus is on the negative. It's pretty hard sometimes to see the bright side. As we see scrolling up on our screen of the TV and the Facebook, the numbers of those that are, die, that are dying and are affected and health care is overrun, we don't always see the good. But not always bad. There is good news out there. We just have to look for it. I believe there's brighter days ahead. I believe that there's brighter days ahead. And I'm not saying that we deny reality, you know, about lives lost and jobs lost and all that. But we can't always just look so focused on the negative and on the here and now that we lose hope for the future. We have to see that this too shall pass. And I believe this, if you trust in God, if you trust in God, you can see beyond all this. You can see beyond this to a future that God has for you and for me. And what I'm saying is this. God is with us right now in our suffering. Because He stood at the grave of Lazarus. Shortest verse in the Bible. What an impact. He stood at the grave of Lazarus. And the Bible says Jesus wept. And I think God's heart is broken when our hearts are broken. And I don't understand sometimes why God allows things to happen. I can't explain it. I really can't. I, I know that there's uh, people that believe, uh, for example, uh, the deist theory that God sort of winds the world up like a clock and then walks off and leaves it and, and lets us fend for ourselves. That's the picture of God that many of our former uh, early presidents had. The other view is that God is so involved in every detail of our life that He even cares about what color we paint our living room. I think that maybe somewhere in between those two extremes is some reality. That if we believe in God, God is... God is with us in our suffering. He weeps with us. When I was a young man, I lost my, we lost our first child. It was a little girl. And I remember that the very next Sunday after the funeral, this, this baby only lived six days. Going to church that Sunday, that it happened to be Easter. And I went to this little Baptist church. And they sung the song, Because He Lives. And out of respect for us who had just lost a child, they left the second verse out, which says, How sweet to hope our newborn baby, to feel the pride and joy He gives. But I want you to know that I didn't lose all hope. I stood at the grave of this child, of this little baby at Golden Oaks Memorial in Ashland, Kentucky. And I said to these words, I'll see you again. 
And I believe, I believe that in this life we're going to see all kinds of things. And I can't promise you a life of roses. But I know this, that because He lives, we can face tomorrow. And because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds the future. And life is worth the living just because He lives. I want to ask the musicians to come as we pray. Father, we stand before the mystery of God. Sometimes without words to adequately express or even explain what we feel. Let us today bring our frustrations and our worries and our cares to You. And God, forgive us of our sins in those times that we don't have the faith that we need. And thank You for the hope that You give us. In Jesus' name, Amen. We're going to sing, but I want to remind you, if you're watching today, that if you need to pray and just ask Jesus, you know I do this all the time with people, a very simple prayer to pray is this, Lord be merciful to me, a sinner. It wouldn't hurt any of us to pray that prayer. But if you'll pray that prayer, mean it from your heart, God will forgive you and have a relationship with you. Won't you do that as we sing?